And now I'm going to go just to Lisa Nandy, the uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary, one of John's colleagues. Lisa, very good to uh, see you. Um, if you'll uh, forgive the big change of subject just, just initially, the appalling scenes we've been seeing uh, in Israel and Gaza over the past couple of days, um, th there are warnings from the UN that this is looking like it's going to head towards war. Um, what, what do you think, because this is really his big first test since being president in foreign policy sphere, what do you think President Biden ought to be saying and doing now? Well, I think the reality is that without some external intervention, the deadlock will continue. We've seen heartbreaking attacks over the last few days. The rocket attacks coming from one side, the airstrikes coming from another. And as a consequence, Israeli and Palestinian civilians are once again paying the price for our inability to come together and solve this. A US special envoy is on the way. I think that's welcome. I think over in the United Kingdom, sadly, our government has stepped out of the picture as an honest broker. The Prime Minister recently trashing the international criminal court process investigating war crimes, which has really cost him the trust of people who want to see a UK government that can bring people round the table and put an end to this. I guess the one thing that is really, really important is not just to stop the rocket attacks and the airstrikes immediately, but for the US to be able to tackle the issue of illegal settlements and forced evictions that started this violence. The reality on the ground is that people are losing hope in a two-state solution because of those illegal settlements. And until they stop, we're not going to see any meaningful process towards peace. So that would be the absolute first priority, I think, for the United States. And just in, in, in you know, the, in, with regards to the position of the Labour Party, I mean, you know, initially, and I completely understand this, you highlighted the violence against uh, Palestinian worship, worshippers outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But I presume you do understand that when literally hundreds and hundreds of rockets are raining down on Israel, on civilians, that is a serious problem for Israel. Uh, absolutely. I've visited Israel myself and met with Israeli citizens who feel absolutely terrified about the prospect of their families losing their lives, just as I've sat with Palestinian families and listened to their stories of coming under attack from airstrikes about the reality of living in the shadow of the wall um, and of the illegal settlements and the forced evictions from their homes. But the truth is, this isn't going to end without finding some meaningful process towards a two-state solution. And over the last few years, what we've seen is that the facts on the ground have been fundamentally altered. President Trump did an enormous amount of damage with his plans around annexation. For a while, it looked like a two-state solution may not be possible at all. The election of President Biden offers a ray of hope in what has been a very, very dark and difficult time for any Palestinian or Israeli who wants to see peace and who wants to see a two-state solution achieved. This is the moment when we've got to redouble our efforts to get that back on track. Lisa, uh, please don't go away, because after the break, there'll be a bit of a change of subject. We're going to be talking to Lisa Nandy and, indeed, John McDonnell about how challenging it'll be for uh, uh, Sir Keir Starmer and Labour to rebuild after those shocking election results. Uh, join us in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Lots more from Lisa Nandy about the uh, attempt by Keir Starmer to revive the Labour Party. First, Anushka. Thank you. Now, earlier I mentioned Tony Blair's article in the New Statesman, and further down it, he made an argument that something we also hear from other wings of the Labour Party, a call for progressive parties to work together, the so-called progressive alliance, because if you look at the projections of what these local results mean for a general election, then you can see here in this tweet that the Conservatives are on 36%, which is the biggest. But if we combine the Labour total and the Lib Dem total, then it is much bigger than that. And in fact, if you add in the others, particularly given how well the Greens did, you find a progressive majority overall. Now, obviously... It isn't that simple. These are different parties with different views. But if they had worked together in 2019, then the progressive group Compass suggests that there were literally 
dozens of seats where the Tories won, but progressives could have beaten them if they worked together. Let me give you some examples. So if Labour voters had swung behind the Lib Dems in Wimbledon, they would have trounced the Tories. If Lib Dems had backed Labour in Truro and Falmouth in the South West, then again, they could have won. Same in Warrington South. They've also included Derby North or York outer, but they're very, very small majorities. Now, like I say, it isn't a magic wand. All these parties would have plenty of different demands to team up. And so far, Labour has never wanted to. But we did see tactical voting in Scotland and there are growing voices on the left who would like it more broadly. Robert. Thanks, Anushka. Um, so back with Lisa Nandy. I mean, Lisa, just I don't know if you'd be following what Anushka said about how essentially parties on the left, when you combine their votes, they, you know, consistently do better than the Tories on their own. And actually, if you look at the mayoral elections, you, you know, where there's a transferable vote system and people's second, second preferences are transferred to a Labour candidate, Labour won in something like ten different areas. Um, so isn't, frankly, the task for Keir to basically make common cause with the Lib Dems and the Greens and do some kind of electoral alliance? Look, I, I believe in working with other progressive politicians. I believe in working actually with whoever it takes in order to deliver change for your own community and for your country. In fact, I believe in it so much, I actually wrote a book with Caroline Lucas and a Lib Dem called Chris Bowers about it a few years ago. But I, I don't believe that there's any substitute for winning the argument and winning back people's trust. And that's the task that Keir set us on a year ago when he was elected leader of the Labour Party. And that is the path that we've been following and in these local elections of course we were disappointed we were disappointed with the Hartley with the poor result we were disappointed where we lost good people and good councils but we also won in a lot of places including in Wales where Mark Drakeford didn't just hold Cardiff he held places like Dellin um, very very different communities communities like mine that have seen decades of economic decline and that's our job is to go out and show people that we understand that because when push comes to shove although the Tories talk a good game about levelling up what they're offering is small high street grants to areas when what they need is good quality jobs that will sustain those communities sure. and those high streets and enable young I, people I'm to I'm going to come back to those issues in, in, in just a minute. But, you know, you're doing a big review uh, of the way forward. Shouldn't part of that review be a look at whether at the next election you should have a formal electoral pact with the Greens and the Lib Dems or indeed any party that you think is progressive in your terms? Now, I think our eye has to be squarely on the country. I was listening to the discussion earlier with John and Ruth. I think we've had a lot of policy pamphlets over the years. We've had a lot of reviews and commissions. What's different about what Annalisa Dodds has been appointed to do is that this is about looking to the country and about what the country needs. And people have been telling this for su us this for such a long time. You only have to come and stand in my constituency in Wigan, in Doncaster, in Hartlepool, in many of those places where we have been losing votes to see that what people are telling us is they want those good quality jobs back into their communities. But you only have to, look at, you, but you only have to look at recent elections to know that the loss of Scotland, I'm not talking about independence, I'm just talking about the loss of a substantial Labour Party there, means that you simply can't win a general election on your own. Well, as I've learned anything over recent years, it's try not to make predictions about what the British public will do because they tend to make up their own minds. And we've had some political earthquakes in recent years. We've seen a very volatile political situation where people will just vote, you know, they'll, they'll, use their, they'll use their heads and they'll vote for what they think is right for their communities. So we saw resounding victories for Andy Burnham, for example, in Greater Manchester, where I'm an MP, not just in Manchester, but in Wigan as well, very different parts of his of his um, of his mayoral region, um, and we've but we saw you know we saw an SNP government returned in Holyrood. I mean we you know we're we're seeing we're seeing people voting for for incumbents, but we're also seeing people voting to you know for packages that they feel will okay. deliver. And, and, and that's our job. That's our job in the end is to convince people sure. that we can be distributed. And, and I want to, to ask you about that because we're almost out of time. Uh, your esteemed deputy leader said that on the doorstep, she said this just a few hours ago, on the doorstep, people didn't know what Keir Starmer stands for. So what does he stand for? I think he stands for decency, actually, which we've seen depart politics in recent years, particularly with this prime minister. 
And, you know, when he goes around the country, he listens to what people have to say. He thinks very hard about how he can fix it. And unlike Boris Johnson, I think you can trust him to deliver it. You can trust his word. We've seen so many broken promises from this government over social care in the Queen's speech, which he promised to fix, over the armed forces, which he said he would protect and then made them redundant, and over nurses' pay. And my message to Boris Johnson is, if you want to level up people in places like Wigan, then you have to start investing in the people, not just the places. So far, we've seen lots of rhetoric, very little action, and that's why we're absolutely determined to make these election results the start of the recovery, where we go out and we win back the trust of people in this country. Lisa, great to see you, as always.